All right, welcome to our fourth video in this series on exploring sports sponsorship. Um, this video is relatively brief, or will be relatively brief, um, but it focuses on a topic that is of significant importance. It's just not one that requires a lot of explanation. This is more about understanding some really critical terminology so that you can best develop a sponsorship proposal that uses activation strategies in a way um, that can cause action, but also are consistent with what the non-sport brand would desire in terms of how it communicates with its uh, consumers, with its ultimate end audience. So first, just some definitions. In previous videos, I've, I've used the terms leverage and activation at times. One of the things that Cornwell 2020 will tell us is that these terms are often uh, used interchangeably, but terms that should not really be used interchangeably. Sometimes you'll hear someone say like, how do you leverage your partnership? And then they'll talk about an activation strategy, for example. And this is still true uh, in the industry today, but this, this really is, um, they're not the same thing. It's not an apples to apples thing. I've chosen the, the image, of course. Um, so here's the two definitions that we have. Leverage is all sponsorship link spending where activation is all audience, brand, interaction, and engagement. So you might say, well, how are those things different? It seems like if I do an audience brand interaction, I probably spent money on doing it. That's probably true. But think of it this way. The money that you spend, the resources that you use to activate are your leveraging strategies. But activations don't necessarily have to require some additional financial outlay. They usually do. They don't always have to is, is the general starting point of this idea. So a, a little bit of, you know, maybe a little bit of an example, a little bit more to think about. So um, activations beyond the definition I just provided you with can also be described as communications that promote engagement or involvement or participation, as it says on the slide. So any actions that promote engagement, involvement, participation. It doesn't have to be a communication piece, though. Some promote the partnership without any sort of active engagement. Some promote the partnership without any additional spending. So ultimately, the way that I would view these things, I would view activation as a subset of the leveraging process that we go through. The, the leveraging process is, is the, the strategic plan that we lay out that is all that we're going to spend and all that we're going to do. It is the case that a lot of those things that we spend and do lead to activation strategies. So in that way, it's kind of a thing that comes uh, below that. It happens uh, after that. However, we can also think about activation strategies that maybe um, didn't cost our organization a significant amount of money or are used for a different reason. Most of the time when we see leveraging strategies, we think, okay, we're going to track these things in some sort of ROI type way. If I'm going to spend a thousand dollars on something, I want to track the return on that investment. Um, that's usually fair when talking about leveraging. But when we talk about activation strategies, it's not always that. So pictured here, We've got the 3M Sensory Room at U.S. Bank Stadium. So 3M is a corporate partner with the Minnesota Vikings and U.S. Bank Stadium. Um, but their, their activation strategies that they use uh, to, um, to make an impact with their intended audience, it's not all in-game video board content or in-game reads or TV commercials during Vikings games or radio commercials during Vikings games. It's some of that and sometimes, sometimes it's that. But this is an example of a different way that they've developed an activation strategy where they don't have a goal of tracking a dollar to dollar, you know, outcome here because U.S. Bank Stadium is obviously a loud venue uh, and because they want to be respectful for Viking fans that maybe don't, um, do well in terms of how they uh, how they engage with the world in really loud environments. You know, think of people that are on uh, the autism spectrum that maybe don't uh, that can't always handle um, you know overstimulation from an auditory perspective. They created this sensory room where you can't hear any of the stadium noise. You don't even actually have uh, anything as far as um, stimulation from the actual football game. But they created this space for people to kind of get away from that if they need it. And it has, as you can kind of see here, a variety of things that are tactile in nature that people can kind of engage with to help them have a better experience at the game if they need it. And interestingly, from 3M's perspective, 
most of those things that are in that room are things that they make. The wall that you see there is made of post-it notes, for example. Um, those blue chairs are, are made out of materials that 3M um, makes and, and puts in. I forget what, what it is. It might be like cotton balls or something like that. Um, but all of them are, not all of them, but a lot of the, the stuff that's in there is made by 3M. They do have a branded area of this room. But more than anything, the goal here is to um, is to help Vikings fans that maybe are sometimes overlooked in, in the context of other corporate partnerships. So this is an activation strategy. It's not one that we would see, and it's not one that they're going to be tracking. Um, you know, well, did that mean that the, the folks that use this room bought season tickets? That's not the goal. That's not even the point of it. They're trying to accomplish something different. 3M is trying to maybe shape the way people think and feel about the brand and also so are the Vikings. So it, but that sort of activation strategy, well, there may be some leveraging and some money that's spent or, or, or not. I mean, you know, if you think about it, it's like, okay, that small room in uh, U.S. Bank Stadium, that's an asset that the Vikings have. It doesn't really cost them anything to do anything with it other than to paint the room maybe or something like that. 3M is using materials that they already have. So the amount of money that's spent on leveraging their partnership in this particular example is very, very minimal, but the activation strategy has maximal impact. So it can kind of show you a little bit of how it's not always about like, what do we, what do, we do to try to impact fans in the most obvious way possible? So um, leveraging is this money, is the money that's spent. Um, one of the things, and this comes up on the next slide too, but one of the old adages in sponsorship is, your your partnership is not going to work if you don't spend more money beyond what what you spent for the access. So if you spend ten thousand dollars on a corporate partnership with a sports team, uh, that does not cover the signage. That does not cover the production of the video for TV commercials or digital ads. It doesn't cover any of that. Um, so there needs to be extra money or time or resources spent creating the content, creating the activations. The money that's spent on that is is leveraging. So. Why, why would we go through this extra spending process? We should not just spend money to spend money. That, you know, the lighting the money on fire thing makes no sense. Instead, what we should do is we should allocate additional resources so that we can allow this non-sport brand to tell its story in the best way possible. Uh, Cornwell also talks about some other reasons why leveraging is important, but the one that I focus on most, or the two that I focus on most, are letting the brand tell the story and finding a way to have your brand, your, 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 the sponsor's brand set itself apart through the process. Um, leveraging can be used as a defensive strategy. It can be used to support audience memory and recall. And there's research that suggests that in sport, the, the ability to recall a, a sponsor is heightened when compared to other sorts of programming that carries with it sponsorships. Think about like you know, reality TV on, on uh, you know, NBC or CBS. We're, we're more likely to remember who our sport team sponsors are because of our emotional attachment there. So there's, there's a lot of different reasons why adding those additional resources in to make this stick is important. But the, the, the starting point of that importance is we can't just say, well, we just got to spend more money on top of this partnership and that's the way that it'll work. No, what we need to do is we need to be strategic about how we're going to allocate additional resources to additional areas in terms of building content, in terms of building activations that will hit the audience that we're hoping to hit in a way that we're hoping to, to kind of hit them. So this, this image here shows, um, and this is not from, uh, from the Cornwell book, but this is just a, a reasonable, uh, picture of the types of places that you might see leveraging occur or play, maybe put a more concise way, places you might spend money to put your sponsorship to work through an activation strategy. So event registration, social media, event photography, email marketing, you can walk through all these things. And, and it's probably not an all encompassing list. Even, you know, there's probably more we can think of, but the idea is anywhere that you're going to put an activation, anywhere you're going to put a message, some of those places are going to cost money we need to be strategic about how we allocate our resources so we're not just again lighting them on fire so when we think about that when we think about being strategic about resource allocation most of the time people will just say well social media that's the magic answer we've got the magic social media wizard that pops down here and they're like well all this is free because we have accounts right you can post on instagram for free free you can post on twitter for free you can you know right you get what i'm saying uh, the the problem with that is no like Yes, you can post 
branded content to your account in your feed for free. You can do that. Um, but that's not the type of content that tends to have enough reach to make any meaningful impact in terms of influencing a large number of people, particularly if the end audience for sponsorship is a traditional consumer or sports fan. So, you know, the idea that we've got this magic answer to all of this, that's the most possible, you know, the, the most efficient, the most effective, the least expensive, um, and with maximum impact um, opportunity is social media and digital advertising. The answer to that is not, not really. I mean, it's not. I mean, and we're, I think, comfortable enough now to know that we get hit with so many social media ads in a day that we just get sick of it. And the clutter in that space is is as bad as that street that we've seen a few times where there's just too many signs and you can't unpack all of it. This is becoming the same way. But now it's not that we're walking down one street with ads. We're walking down all of these streets with ads and it gets really co confusing and complicated, not in a way that overwhelms us and makes us irritated, although maybe it does that, but in a way that things don't stick with us the way that they, they may be used to because there's so much. So social and digital media should be a part of the plan, but it shouldn't be the only part of the plan. It needs to be an integrated, when we successfully sell a sponsorship, it does need to be an integrated partnership. Unless the, the focal brand's goal is to do all social media or digital things, then of course we pivot that direction. But, um, you know, from, from my perspective, this isn't some magic answer. It's just another tool in the tool belt on the way to building a good partnership. So, uh, one of the other things to kind of close on here is this idea of, um, the, the ratio of spending on the sponsorship. So 10,000 on the partnership to, the amount of money spent on activation strategies. So the leveraging spend. Uh, conventional wisdom has said, if you spend 10,000 on a partnership, you should plan to spend 10,000 on your leveraging and activation strategies. Um, definitely an oversimplification. And you probably would know that without me saying it. So what these questions that you see here um, are meant to do is give you the context to say, okay, if we build a partnership for a focal brand, and we say, this is going to cost you a million dollars. We don't want to immediately hit them with, and also you're going to spend another million dollars on all these other things. We do need to walk them through how the additional resources will be required to make the activations work as best they can. But we don't want to just be like, well, plan on spending an extra million, right? We need to be more concerted than that. We need to walk through the different elements of the proposal so that we can be uh, a really good consultant in that way. So sponsorship leverage is another topic that we should kind of think about when we think about the overall cost of, of the, uh, the partnership. Another case to close, uh, Adidas is the, uh, is the kit manufacturer, but also a corporate partner or a sponsor, um, with the German football federation. Uh, so you can see three players pictured here wearing the national team jersey with the Adidas, uh, logo on it as they've created those jerseys. But the link here will allow you to, uh, take a look at an article that talks about how Adidas and the German Football Federation have extended their partnership into 2026, I believe. I forget the year. Maybe it's beyond that. Maybe it's even into the 2030s. Uh, sounds like a made up year, but, uh, in, in any event, uh, have a look at that article if you want to learn a little bit more about how um, Adidas has decided to partner with the German Football Federation and what some of their leveraging and activation strategies might look like. That's all for this video. Once again, as, and as always, thanks for your time. Thanks for getting all the way to the end of this. Uh, I appreciate it.